just looking at load shedding, and I just want to say that the, the, the deliberate and controlled interruption of electricity supply has emerged as a significant and multifaceted challenge in many parts of the world, but it has certainly affected us not only in the working sphere, but even within the family structures, uh, the, the wellness, the emotional wellness, the physical wellness. And from a psychiatric perspective, the irregular power supply caused by load shedding can disrupt daily routines, as we know, disturb sleep patterns, induce anxiety and stress among individuals and prolonged exposure to certain power availability may contribute to mood disorders, exacerbate pre-existing psychiatric conditions. Moreover, the inability to access electronic devices and engage in leisure activities may lead to feelings of isolation and exacerbate symptoms of depression. So I'm not going to go into this, but just to make you understand that this is a very holistic approach to unpacking the subject, understanding it, and coming forward with solutions on how to turn the crisis into an opportunity. Jazakallah khair. I'm sure you're going to enjoy this session. We're going to hand over to Molana Ravad now, and then our other panelists. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillah wa salatu wa salamu ala Rasulillah wa ba'd. Respected doctors and panelists, my brief is to speak about the therapeutic advances following Sunnah methodology. Allow me to start with the quote from the famous Andalusian scholar Ibn Hazm. He says that I have searched for a common goal amongst mankind. I've applied my mind, I've exerted myself to see what is the one thing that almost every other human is searching for. And he said, I have found nothing other than the conquering of anxiety. Everyone wants to vanquish and overcome their personal and collective anxieties. So that pursuit of an emotional balance, the diminishing of anxiety, stress, depression, that we have to deal with is a universal thing and it continues up to today. Despite the immense scientific progress and the medical advancements that have been made, we all know that there's a great decline in the general mental well-being of people across faith communities, across the race and ethnic divide. It's a global challenge. Now let me say up front, I'm no expert. But this is a topical issue even for ulama and even for scholars. And what I'm going to share with you today is just my thoughts and my conclusions on this very journey where I'm also exploring, reading, studying, engaging, and thinking around this very topical issue. If it makes sense, well and good. If not, you have the choice to discard it. I also want to mention that my attempt this, after, this morning is to try and simplify the issues so that we can demystify the Islamic position. The big question is, what does Islam say about this topical issue? So that is one of four questions that I'm going to endeavor to answer over the next half an hour. The first being, what does Islam say about mental health? The second is, what is the history and the legacy of Islam when it comes to mental health? The third, what are the differences or some of the differences between the Western approach and the Islamic approach? And the fourth then would be the treatments and solutions from Quran and Sunnah that speak more to the overall title of this particular presentation. So starting with that first question, the first of four, I don't have a PowerPoint, that's just a personal thing, it distracts me. You know, it, it, it disrupts my, my flow of thought, so bear with me, but I'm trying to keep it as structured as possible so that you can make mental notes or, or physical notes without the assistance of slides. Another thing why I don't use PowerPoints is because it irks me. People don't pay attention. They just take pictures of the slides. And they think that they're going to refer to those slides later on, and they never do. Apart from the fact that it makes my work more tough in putting those slides together. So what is the Islamic position on mental health? Broadly speaking, it's the middle path between two extremes, like everything else. Ummatan wasata. So what's the one extreme? 
The one extreme is what we commonly hear being expressed in our community. Did Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam ever see a psychiatrist or a psychologist or a therapist? What is all this modern day nonsense? Sahaba had difficulties, they had challenges, they had three stones tied around their bellies. Did they go to a psychologist or to a psychiatrist or did they go for therapy? Or did they strengthen their faith and get on with life? That's one extreme view. Another extreme view is that this is purely a physical, biological issue and it should be treated with modern day therapy and medication and spirituality and religion has no role. So that's the other extreme. And the Islamic position is like the Quran tells us, we are an ummah of balance, an ummah of moderation, the middle path, it's there in the middle. The truth is that there's no doubt there are biological components to our emotions and there are biological components in terms of what affects our minds and our souls and our psyche, but that's not the only component. And I'll touch more on this a little bit later. In short, to answer this first question, the Islamic position is that mental health revolves around several factors, physical, biological, emotional, psychological, spiritual, metaphysical, and even supernatural. So yes, the jinn, jadu, black magic also does factor in here. So when it comes to prevention, when it comes to the cause, and when it comes to the cure, at times it could be one of the listed factors, but most instances it revolves around a combination of all or most of those factors which I have listed. So you cannot take a simplistic approach to something which is multifaceted and nuanced. You can't say, well, Nabi Sassanam didn't see a psychologist, so why should we? At the same time, you can't say, well, this is purely physical and biological. Where does religion come into this? You scholars don't know anything about this. Leave it to us professionals who have done a degree. It's a multifaceted issue in terms of its causes and in terms of its cures, and you have to approach it from that particular perspective. Let me say this to wrap up the first of the four questions. There's the hadith which underpins the, the Islamic perspective. Ma anzal Allahu da'an illa anzalahu, illa anzalahu dawa. That for every cure that Allah has sent, Allah has also sent a... For every sickness that Allah has sent, Allah has also sent a cure. This does not only apply to physical ailments and sicknesses, but it applies to mental and emotional ones as well. So our minds, our thoughts, our feelings, we need to care for it frequently and we need to care for it purposely. And mental health, in other words, from an Islamic perspective, is governed by many internal factors like your anxiety, depression, worry and many outside factors as well, like sickness, hardship, loss. So that's the first part. In, in a nutshell, that what is the Islamic position? It's in the middle. It's moderate. So what is the legacy and history of mental health in Islam? Let's start with the prophets, because that's the obvious reference point. The famous story of Yusuf, السلام, Joseph, we see in the very categoric verse of the Quran, Ya, ya Asafa ala Yusuf, a prophet, Yaqub, Jacob, the son of a prophet, the grandson of, the pro of a prophet, the father of a prophet. This is a house of Nubuwa and prophethood. And what does he say? Oh, my grief over Yusuf. Oh, my depression over Yusuf. So even the Anbiya Ali Musaratu wasalam, had emotional challenges. If we look at Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and I'm not going to go into the details, right? Because I need to focus more on the latter part of the presentation. The Amul Huzn. After three years of social and economic boycott, which brought with it its own stresses, seeing your own children suffer. They say Fatima radiallahu used to cry as a baby out of the pangs of hunger in those three years. Her cries used to echo in the valleys of, of Makkah. Can you imagine what that did to the psyche of her parents? And they come out of those three years of social and economic boycott and the rock in the life of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Khadija radiallahu anha, passes away. Then his greatest political support, his uncle Abu Talib, passes away. Then he goes to Ta'if, and we all know what happens to Ta'if. The, the historians and the biographers and the ulama of Sira have referred to it as the year of sorrow. It was the year of sorrow in the life of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But even before that, when Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came after the first revelation, was he not suffering from anxiety at that particular time? When he said to his wife, Zammiluni, Zammiluni, <coughs> Dathiruni, Dathiruni, he was anxious. He was worried that what is this, this revelation that has come to me? And Khadija radiallahu anha had to console him. When there was a period what is referred to as the Fatrat Wahi, the cessation of revelation, revelation had not come to answer the questions that Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had told the Meccans that he would answer. At that time, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam became worried. He became anxious. He became grieved. That's why Allah revealed Surah Duha and said, 
ما ودعك ربك وما قلا your allah has not deserted you and your allah is not displeased with you the messiah was worried why is the revelation not coming is allah unhappy those are emotions and we see those emotions in the life of the anbiya ali musallatu wassalam and even in the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam one more example when the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam we know all of his male offspring had passed on and the last was his son ibrahim and when his son ibrahim was in the throes of death the nabi of allah was holding him and he was crying and he said inna inna al-ayna tadma the eyes cry wal qalb yahzan and the heart grieves acknowledgement of a human emotion the heart grieves wala naqulu illa ma yarda rabbuna but the difference is as muslims we will only say that which is pleasing to allah and then he said wa inna bi firaqika ya ibrahim la mahzunun your departure from this world o ibrahim has put us into sorrow and has put us into grief so we can see that nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam acknowledged human emotions mental health issues as we would term it today dua which nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam had shared with us and this dua illustrates how nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam acknowledged the different facets of what today we call mental health it's the famous dua اللهم اني اعوذ بك من الهم والحزن واعوذ بك من العجز والكسل واعوذ بك من الجبن والبخل واعوذ بك من غلبة الدين وقهر الرجال let me run you through the words here what exactly is nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam teaching us to ask for that oh allah i seek your protection from ham what is ham ham is anxiety ham is constant worry and fear where you become agitated restless you're on edge all the time everyone gets onto your nerves that's ham i huzn huzn is sorrow the word he used on the departure of his son Ibrahim where you start to feel after that that you know will I ever be happy again that's huzn ajz is a a sense of inability when you have a bleak outlook and you start wondering that will will nothing ever get better after this kasal is fatigue where you become sluggish where even small tasks are exhausting and they take longer to complete and jubn is what they would refer to as a lack of self confidence where you over critical of yourself where you criticize yourself on perceived faults and mistakes bukhl is to be self-centered when you're not interested in the welfare of others you you self obsessed you all the time throwing yourself a pity party you 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 drowning in your own gloom ghalabat ad-dain debt brings with it its own set of mental and psychological challenges wa qahr ar-rijal and the dominance of others over you as those who work for a boss about the mental challenges that go with that So we can see from these examples of Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam that human emotions fluctuate you have your ups you have your downs there are times when you're happy and elated and there are times when you're down and you're stressed and and you're feeling depressed and you're feeling low on energy and you just don't have the motivation that's part of the natural struggles of life the Quran tells us innal insana khuliqa halu'a Allah says i have created man restless i have created man impatient idha massahu sharru jazu'a that whenever misfortune touches him then he is filled with self pity he starts to lament over his misfortune so without you know elaborating further that answers the first part of the question with regards to the history and the legacy of mental health issues in islam from the perspective of the prophets let's look at it from the perspective of muslim practitioners thereafter suffice to say many of these muslim practitioners were pioneers in the field of uh, of mental health as we would and i'm using the term mental health very generically very broadly so we see after the demise of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam you had those who looked at the legacy and the teachings of nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam in terms of mental health and other civilizations and so how could we bring it within the framework of islam and use it to be of benefit to muslims and non muslims alike so in baghdad you had the coming together of muslims and non muslim physicians and practitioners and they were collaborating to produce knowledge related to the human psyche they were exploring the topic of the nafs which is the self the ruh which is the soul the aql which is the mind the one example is that of kindi he's known as the philosopher of the arabs the abbasid khalifa ma'mun and thereafter mu'tasim they com- they instructed him to oversee the translation of the greek works at baghdad's great house of wisdom and see what of that work is compliant with the framework of islam and sharia that can be useful when it comes to mental health and he wrote the book uh 
describing the cognitive strategies to fight depression. The, the, the title of the book in English is The Trick to Repelling Sorrows. Then you see the other great Islamic scholar, Balkhi, who looked primarily at medicine and revelation, Quran and Sunnah. And he wrote his book, The Sustenance of the Body and Soul. And he cautioned that a time will come when almost everyone will have some sort of medical challenge or the other. He cautioned in that, uh, that book. He gave definitions to depression, anxiety, phobias, obsessive compulsive disorder already that time. And we see in Islamic states at, at the time when they were flourishing, like Damascus, Baghdad, Cairo, those cities, they were always psychiatric wards. They were always wards within the mainstream hospitals to deal with mental related uh, challenges and issues. So that's the second part that I wanted to touch on. The first part is, what is the Islamic position? What is the Islamic history and heritage? And I've spoken about that from the perspective of the prophets and from the perspective of some of uh, the Muslim practitioners without having the, the latitude of time to go into too much more detail. Now coming to what I think is very integral, because we've got to understand this before we can appreciate what's going to come at the end in terms of therapy and treatments that is rooted in Quran and Sunnah. What, is, what are some of the differences, some of the main differences between the Western approach to mental health and the Islamic approach. I'm just going to list a few. The first is that the Western approach is all about the body. It's biological. The Islamic approach, we as Muslims believe that a man is a combination of ruh and jasad, body and soul. And the soul is primary. Because the soul was created first, and it is only when the soul was inserted into the body that the body became alive. And death is not the demise of the soul. Death is the separation of the soul from the body, which renders the body a mere corpse, and the soul then traverses into the afterlife. So you've got to nourish your body, and you've got to nourish your soul. And when you nourish both adequately, that's what you put yourself in a position to live an optimal life. Today I'm hearing that doctors are talking about soul loss, S-O-U-L, right? And it's an interesting phenomenon because they're saying we have an overnourished body and an undernourished soul which creates a vacuum in between, which creates that vacuum which at times is the root for many of these mental challenges that you have because some people have everything going for them in life and you run all the tests and everything comes back clear. So what is the, what is the problem then? Why are they constantly agitated, anxious, no contentment, no satisfaction in life? This is perhaps one area to look, that your physical body is overnourished but your soul is malnourished. And that creates an imbalance. That creates a problem. So the West only looks at it from a biological perspective. It's all about naturalism. So they exclude the spiritual. It's all about humanism. They exclude the divine. It's all about nihilism. So there's no religious principles that will be applied. And it's all about hedonism. The Western approach is that your perceived pleasure is the ultimate goal. Your perceived pleasure is the highest aim of human life. And we know as Muslims, that is not the highest aim of human life. So that's the one difference between a Western approach and an Islamic approach. The Western approach is purely about pleasure and the body and how to restore that if mental health has compromised it. An Islamic approach is that you are a combination of both. You've got to look after both adequately and proportionately. The second difference is the Western approach confuses pleasure with happiness. There's a big difference between pleasure and happiness. Pleasure has got to do with your senses. It brings temporary joy, but it can never bring everlasting happiness. It has to do with physical sensations. Happiness, on the other hand, is an inner peace, a mental and emotional calmness. They say happiness is not out there, it's in here. Happiness is not out there, it's in here. Happiness is not a destination that you arrive at. It's not goals, it's not your wish list, it's not your bucket list. Happiness is enjoying the travel, enjoying the journey making the most of what you already have, not focusing on what you still have. Now, we know that the other aspect of, I'm seeing 17 minutes, so I, I said I've got a reminder for five minutes, so all right, maybe my time has been cut. <clears throat> let, let me try and, 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 and fast track because I'm, I'm coming to the, to the key part, part of it. The other difference between the Western approach and the Islamic approach is the Western approach is pain is meaningless. Pain is an obstacle in life. Whereas Islam tells you that pain has meaning. Pain is purposeful. 
pain is redemptive and you don't always have to focus on removing the pain because pain energizes you and brings you closer to Allah. Allah tests test those whom he loves the most. Allah test, the more Allah tests you, it's a greater sign of Allah's love. And whilst you don't wish for difficulty because you've got to consider yourself weak, when difficulty comes, it gives you an opportunity of spiritually cleansing yourself. The hadith tells us that every form of difficulty, fatigue, illness, distress, worry, grief, harm, even the pricking of a thorn will increase your good deeds and be an expiation for your sins. So pain in Islam is not meaningless. Pain has a wisdom behind it, a divine wisdom behind it. That's why in the hadith it is mentioned, may yuridillahu bi khayran yusib minhu. That when Allah intends good for you, Allah afflicts you. When Allah intends good for you, Allah afflicts you. So the spiritual element, what today the, the life coaches are talking about, spiritual intelligence. Spiritual intelligence is the approach that Islam takes. That when things happen around you, both positive and negative, you take a positive meaning out of it. And that develops inspiration, optimism, gratitude, and perseverance. Whereas when you don't have spiritual intelligence, when you only ap approach things from a biological, physical perspective, then it's going to develop anger, jealousy, arrogance, and conceit. You see, here's the thing. If we believe that thoughts can have an impact on our physical well-being, then we also have to realize that our internal condition will have an impact on our overall well-being. Here's the long and short of it. If Allah is happy with you, you will be happy. If Allah is not happy with you, you will never be happy. And that's the difference between a Western approach and an Islamic approach. Your own connection with your creator, your own level of obedience, the prevalence of sin in your life cannot be discounted. It cannot be discounted. Uh, let me say this. This is all my own humble analysis. You see, they, there's two extremes I spoke about. Some people will say, okay, you're feeling depressed, you're feeling anxious. Strengthen your relationship with Allah. Read more Salah, read more Quran, everything will come right. That, that's one extreme. The other extreme is to negate it altogether. A good spiritual relationship with your creator is like good physical nutrition. So all doctors say, have a good diet. But does a good diet mean you'll never get sick? Or you'll never have a chronic illness? Or you'll never have a terminal illness? No. But what it means is it gives you the best chance in terms of prevention. It gives you the best chance in terms of mitigating the impact. And it gives you the best chance in terms of cure if you have a good diet. So if you have a strong relationship with Allah, you're giving yourself the best chance in terms of prevention, mitigation, and cure. Doesn't mean it will never happen. Right, so coming to the last and the most important part, and that is treatment and solutions from the Quran and Sunnah. I have 10 points listed, I'll go through it very quickly. The first is, develop your spirituality. How? By strengthening your belief in taqdeer. Today, psychologists are saying, the immune system works better when you don't have a choice. So who better to make the choice for you than Allah? Whatever happens, happens for a reason, whether you understand it or not. Right? The second is sabr. But sabr is not patience. Sabr actually means perseverance and resilience. That's why Ibn Qayyim said, you can never, you can, the, the past can never be changed or corrected with sadness, but rather with contentment, gratitude, sabr, which is resilience and a firm belief in, the, in taqdeer, in the decision of Allah. That is what they refer to today as self-regulation that you regulate your own emotions based on what's happening, positive and negative, to give yourself the best possible chance at, uh, at happiness. So sabr, according to Ibn Qayyim, is about, he said it's three components, restraining, strength, and building. Restraining, strength, and building. So live in the present. Don't fret too much about the past and don't obsess over the future. Learn from the past. Be moderate in your planning for the future, but live in the present. In the present. Also part of enhancing your, your, your spirituality is using dua as psychotherapy. There's a dua that Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi taught us for grief. And that dua, I don't have time to go into the translation, but if you look at it, there's no direct supplication to Allah. There's only words of submission. Dua, you don't always have to have a wish list. You just have to humble yourself in front of Allah when you are faced with trial and tribulation and even when you're enjoying prosperity. It's a conversation that you have with your maker. And at the end of that dua, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam teaches us for Allahumma inna abiduk, banu abidik, banu imaik. At the end of that dua, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam teaches us an taj'al al-Qur'an al-'azim rabi'a qulubina. That make the Qur'an the springtime of our heart. So recitation of the Qur'an and reading in general is one of the best antidepressants. Salah, the bowing and the prostration are the physical manifestations of our perfect 
submission and reliance on Allah. Salah allows you spiritually to go into the next world. And the calmness that that brings to the stresses of the life when done correctly is something which nothing else can beat. And that's what we find in our tradition. That the closest you can be to your maker is in salah. That's why Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he was distressed, he would say, Arihna bis salati ya Bilal. Bilal, bring comfort to us by giving the adhan. Bring comfort to us. Jonathan Fields has written that you need stabilizing factors in your life. There's no greater stabilizer in your life than salam. Dhikr, if thoughts can affect your well-being, then chanting has to affect your well-being. Allah bi dhikri Allahi tatma'innul qulub. Have expectations in Allah alone. To have good expectations of Allah is part of ibadah. When you have expectations in others, especially those closest to you, that's when you set yourself up for disappointment and depression. And practice optimism. Practice optimism. When Yaqub lost Yusuf on top of that, he loses Binyamin and the eldest son. And he says, Asallahu bihim jami'a. I have hope that Allah will bring them all to me. So I see I'm at 24 minutes according to my clock. I'm going to wrap up in three minutes to uh, just try and, I know that they're trying to, to, to adjust for time. So the first is about enhancing your spirituality. The second is your relationships. Invest more in your family than for your family. The irony of our lives is we treat the people we love the most the worst because of our stresses. The third is diet. See, Aisha radiallahu when there was a house that they just lost someone, a bereaved house, she would say, make talbina and make tharid, right? Why? Because Nabi sallallahu alayhi wasallam said, these dishes suit the heart of the patient and relieve sadness. What does this tell us? That medication has an effect in the words of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wasallam. If food can have an effect, why can't medication have an effect? So the treatment is not all spiritual, but at the same time, the treatment cannot exclude spirituality altogether. Adopt an attitude of gratitude. For us, it's never enough. But the hadith tells us if you look at those who have less from a material perspective, and if you look at those who are doing more from a spiritual perspective, you'll always be grateful. Focus on what you have, not on what you don't have. Stop comparing with others is the fifth. The sixth, you want to be happy, make others happy. Be community-centric. The greatest satisfaction in life is in bringing happiness to others. Don't be self-centered and selfish. Those people are never happy. The seventh, forgive others. Let go of that emotional bondage of hatred and anger. The eighth, choose your friends and your company wisely because happiness and sadness are both contagious. You know, I can understand the natural discourse. You go to any function today, we're talking about load shedding, we're talking about the corrupt government, we're talking about the tanking economy. But you know what? These pity parties are contagious. When you're throwing a moan fest all the time, when the national narrative and the community narrative becomes too negative, it impacts on your psyche. The, the, the ninth, don't fear failure. In Arabic, they say, Rubba illatin kanat sababu siha. Sometimes you have to get ill before you can get better. You have a heart attack after that, you go to gym, you lose all the weight, you have a good diet for the rest of your life because there's a wake up call. So failure is meant to re energize you, to bring you back stronger, to humble you, to bring you closer to Allah. They say, if you can understand failure, you can fail your way to success. If you can understand failure, you can fail your way to success. The last of the ten that I share with you is trust in Allah. That if you trust in Allah, Allah will be sufficient for you in a way that Allah knows is best for you. My concluding thoughts. See, Islam is a complete way of life. And that applies also to mental health. Everything is part of Islam as long as it is compliant to the framework of Islam. So going to see a therapist, going to see a psychologist, going to see a psychiatrist, taking medication, being diagnosed, all of that is part of Islam. Because Islam advocates that we must encourage the expert, we must accept the expertise and we must engage the expertise wherever it lies. But as Muslims, it must always be within the framework of what is permissible and impermissible in Islam. So you don't exclude all the expertise and say it's only spiritual, but you do not only look at the expertise and exclude spirituality. We've got to start appreciating each other. I think when it comes to mental health, the professionals have their role. The community leaders have their role. The ulama and the scholars have their role. We all have to play our roles adequately if there's going to be holistic treatment. And we've all got to work in tandem. I leave you with this thought. I leave you with this thought. Islam is not therapy. Islam is not therapy. Islam is submission. But if you submit to the teachings of Islam, that will become therapeutic. May Allah grant me and all of us the tawfiq wa da'wan alhamdulillah. Amin, thumma amin, mashallah, on those powerful, poignant words and words of wisdom. 
And I think the key message that we've realized here is not an either or, it's a both and, it's a holistic, integrated and comprehensive approach, both the secular and the Sharia perspective. So now we're going to hand over to Dr. Naeem Mullah. Shukran Dalil and to our esteemed Molana Suleiman Ravid. Assalamu alaikum. It's it's a tough act to follow, Mulana Rawat, but but a, a good introduction to integrative psychiatry as well. We're catching up with Islam. That's what psychiatry is, uh, integrative psychiatry. That is, considering the, the the emotional aspects, the cognitive aspects, the the physical aspects, as well as the social aspects with spiritual grounding coupled with this. So yeah, that's that's essentially introduction to who I am and, and what I've been doing in the background with my, my approach to, to psychiatry. So yeah, we, we're gonna talk about the, the mental impacts of, of load shedding and, and, and as we would like to encapsulate load shedding as a potential stressor uh, to, to understand what it's gonna do to our body. So I'm, I'm gonna give a bit of the physiological overview, a bit of the psychological processing and pattern behavior that can come out of this, this, this challenge that we are facing more frequently. Uh, of course, like all stresses, uh, it creates a stress response within our physiology, and that stress response, I'm sure you're all well, well affair with, 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 the, with the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis and, and the release of the sympathetic surges with norepinephrine and the adrenal gland into kicking into action, and the release of cortisol and, and its impacts on the physiology of, of the individual. From, from acute responses with increased heart rate and, and uh, in this, a spiking of blood pressure with peripheral vasoconstriction and, and shutting down of metabolism and, and endocrine functions where otherwise not needed in the physiology, all in the aim to assist one get beyond the so-called challenge. Uh, when we're dealing with something like, like a, a protracted challenge with, with uh, load shedding, this, this then creates us, well, for those individuals who are battling to accommodate to from the acute challenge into chronic stress response. And with this chronic stress response, we have then perpetuating impacts to physiology from the adrenal, from, from uh, the cortisol release to abundant sugar availability within the blood to, to suppression of insulin functioning uh, to act over stimulation and activation of the prefrontal cortex with, with uh, residual sleep disturbances, overthinking uh, uh, risks, as well as tension in our physiology in the activated musculature that, that then can react, cause more reactive behaviors within us, snapping at others, uh, being impatient in traffic, and so forth and so on. So, so all of this is, is truly variable, of course, to, to the history of the individual. And the history of the individual goes right back into intrauterine space, where, where methylation of, 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 of cortisol response in gene can already take place, and, and the stress response from within the gut creates an individual who is that much less resilient to such challenges as they come forward in life. And this, of course, then is protracted uh, with, with uh, further adversity from a modeling of parenting that, that can further knock down or enhance the resilience of an individual coming forward. All of this, of course, internalizes into an area of the brain we know as the limbic cortex, the very subconscious part deep in the temporal lobe where our emotional processing takes place. And primarily that is the first part of the, the emotional side, is the first part of the brain that comes online in more, more maturity than the uh, intellectual part, which normally come online about 25 years old by full development. So within that emotional structures is truly where we sit with multitasking thinking, very profound thinking in that subconscious. And in there come pattern behaviors that activate the way we respond to stresses by variables of our exposure to what, who our parents were, how they responded to the environments around us that also can mold us to how we were treated by teachers, by fellow colleagues at school, all the way to, to young adult form, invariably creating a repertoire of responses that can either serve us or, of course, at the same time, sabotage us to, to outcomes in front of us. And invariably, this is what leads people to psychiatry over time. It's, it's, it's multiple insults over a period of their, their development coming through to, to eventually having complex poor responders and, and heightened stress response in the background, which is why I, I propose to say we have a lot of locked-in physiology where a lot of people are locked into fight-or-flight response 
from very early in life and don't really realize it and then live into a modern society that is demanding in terms of output or in terms of uh, you're showing up for, for whatever the responsibilities in front of you and our poor conceptualizing of this in our own minds, the story we tell ourselves, of course, that invariably creates uh, chronic stress responses that, that of course, uh, outcomes are not just into the psychiatric domain, but of course into general medicine as well, which is what all of medicine is primarily uh, an outcome of chronic stress response or poorly, poorly adapted to uh, stress challenges. Uh, so, so within the subconscious realm is, is, is patterns of self-talk that may have been internalized within the, within the first phase of life where, where depending on how our parents engaged us, and again that's where the parenting model comes in, we internalize talks to self that can actually sabotage us or, or serve us again. And invariably in, in a pattern of people who are poorly responsive to, to the challenges of, of uh, any new adversity, they more likely have very self-critical, self-dismissive, self-negating responses to self, in, in talk to self, thereby almost uh, whipping themselves with their own word and activating more of a stress response in the background, creating more surges of adrenaline and dopamine under acute circumstances on a previously already higher, higher than baseline activated sense of, of adrenaline and dopamine. Uh, and and to, to, to where does this all come from? I mean, here we live in this, this colonial society, an extension of, of our colonial masters of, of, of the Euro, Europe and, and UK. And this, this structure of society is one that actually sabotages us into a distorted stress response, where we invariably we're more submissive in outlook, more uh, uh, wired to actually fixate on our responsibilities at an expense of ourselves, and invariably walk into a pattern of lifestyle that brings us to midlife crises with multiple stress response complications in our body from hypertension, diabetes, and such variables. So yeah, but not is all doom and gloom, of course, to those who take on the uh, stress through, through, through such challenges of, of what we consider the, the, uh, the challenges of load shedding. There are others who can actually encompass that to be quite a grounding space. Yeah, we talk about uh, lack of accessibility to our electronics and, and communication with others. But I think that's where the fault is. We, we don't leave ourselves time with contemplation and in our own minds to actually grow our own resilience over a period of time. And invariably, uh, those that are wise to this actually don't get don't succumb to the challenge of load shedding, but invariably uh, actually utilize the space to enhance their own functioning and grounding. So the, 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 the mental health outcomes of, of load shedding go along a spectrum, of course, since that's what I'm trying to apply. But in, in, in majority of the individuals out there, they would be a primarily skewed to the negative outcome, unfortunately, to the structure of society that we come from. Again, taking back to Mulana Rao, it's outlook, there's, there's so many variables of, of what we can do to, to sustain ourselves, and I'm not gonna delve too much into to so much of, the, of that now, I'm gonna go through this with the panel discussion into what we can do to alleviate the space. But from a perspective of the physiology, we have heightened levels of cortisol in our body, epinephrine and norepinephrine fluctuating, with knock-on impacts to bone metabolism, to, to thyroid functioning, to, to sugar processing, and invariably a lot of other complications coming from that with poor sleep quality, poor impact to, to cognitive processing, catching ourselves off guard and not being in the moment of our lives, therefore more likely to have reactive and snappy responses to the moment, and more tension carried through in our body. Body and invariably, like, like Mulana Rawat has also alluded to, projected out our inner dynamic of our family. They tend to be the punching bags to, to receive the worst of what we have in, in us. Uh, with that, I, I'm, I'm not going to delve too much further in. I know I've got a lot more time, but I'm going to hand over to my colleagues because we're going to talk more into responses and, and how to, to adjust to this challenge as we go along. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, so I'm a sociologist, which means that I probably don't belong here in such illustrious company, but I'll, I'll, I'll do my best. I think that when we think about sociology, we think about understanding ourselves from the outside in. So we've had a, a brilliant spiritual awakening here today in our first speaker. And our second speaker helps us to understand what it actually means when we don't get that spiritual side right. But you know, the South African Depression and Anxiety Group and I sat down with my colleague Fatima and we thought about how do we scream into the void when the power goes out? Who cares? I complain to the government. I complain to my local councillor. 
And everyone says it's a short-term pain for a long-term gain, but I'm suffering now. So in January, before the government and ESCOM made the announcement that we were going to have long-term load shedding, there was a little bit of hope. Maybe it comes, maybe it goes, maybe it goes and stays away, maybe it comes back again. And what happened? At the start of all of this process, people thought load shedding is a temporary scourge. Now it's become a long-term stressor. What happens to our responses when something that's supposed to be temporary becomes a long-term issue? In our research, we spoke to 1,836 brave souls who told us how load shedding is making them feel. We spoke to people at the top and the bottom of the South African spectrum. The people at the top are the people that we spoke to who've got computers, the internet, and ways of coping. The people at the bottom that we spoke to, ironically, were more resilient. They grew up without electricity, outside of cities, and outside of privileged spaces. And they go, load shedding, I don't care. Up until I was 12, I didn't even switch on a light in my house. What are you complaining about? But the rest of us live in cities where things have to go fast. Everybody wants something to happen now. And in our research findings, it was so powerful to see that one in three people said, my boss wants me to work now. But then we see people who say, when the power goes out, my existence stops. No more animation, no more thinking, no more doing, no more trying, I sleep. The vast number of individuals in our research had sedentary coping. And we know that in terms of our mental and spiritual health, we have to connect, we have to talk, we have to think, we have to feel, we have to be. And if load shedding says that I don't get to be, what happens to my mental health? One brave soul said, that she had just gotten control over a major depressive episode. She'd been in bed day in and day out for three years, and now, through the ability that she had to plan her day, take her medication, go to church, talk to people, she was coming right. And now the power goes out, and the power stays out. And what can she do? And she said movingly, I sit in the dark and I cry. One in 10 people that we surveyed talked about thoughts of suicide when the power was out. When the lights came back, the feelings disappeared. Let's talk about our fight or flight response. So interesting to me. It's not when the power goes out that we are stressed. It's when the power doesn't come back on that our stress levels rise. It's when we receive that message on our phone that says the stages are going from four to six. Then we start scrolling through the internet, trying to find out what are they fixing? How many units are down? Do we believe? Do we even believe what they're saying to us anymore? Now we're finding individuals that were calm, emotionally regulated, relaxed people who write to us in the survey and say, all of a sudden I'm angry. All of a sudden I'm shouting at my spouse. All of a sudden, I don't want to speak to my children. And all of a sudden, I'm out of control. So we have helplessness, people who are feeling out of control. All of these things that I'm talking about, it's not new information. What's interesting in our research, four in 10 people reported feeling depressed during periods of intensified load shedding. Six in 10 people felt anxious. Is that 100%? Is that all of us? No, it's not, because depression and anxiety work on a continuum. The more anxious we feel, the more resources we use, the more likely we are to feel hopeless, helpless, and depressed. What's making these individuals feel depressed? What's making all of us worry? Seven in 10 individuals reported in the survey that there were crimes that took place during load shedding. Crimes that these individuals think might have taken place outside of load shedding, but the truth is we'll never know because they took place in the dark. Nine and a half out of 10, well, not really half a person, 96 and 97% are worried about job losses, worried about the fact that they can't get their work done, worried about the fact that businesses are closing and worried that the economy is going to fail. I just opened up the newspaper this week and according to prolonged load shedding experts, of which I sort of think of myself as a minnow, people who know better than I do are saying that the property market is going to suffer. So those of us that invested in bricks and mortar, 
those of us that invested in South Africa are in some degree of trouble. What does that mean for our psychological scaffolding? One in 10 people in this fairly privileged sample of ours were able to go solar. What does nine out of 10 do? Take a bank loan, levy it against a house, but the housing market is collapsing, the economy is going down. What do I do? Interest rates are going up, electricity is going down. The key thing to remember is that they control the grid, but we control what goes on in here. Time belongs to us. Now, a lot of people are sleeping, doom scrolling and just avoiding load shedding. Others are scrambling around trying to complete work and studies. But the individuals who are very interesting to me are not just these rural individuals who are used to living without power. There are some individuals that say, no, load shedding will not affect my life. It will not do anything to me. So one in 10 are feeling as if life is over and feeling suicidal. Another one in 10 haven't bought solar panels. What are those people doing? They're planning around the schedule. Well, so now we must all be resilient because South Africans are known for our resilience. No, their resilience is coming from saying, this is not okay. So in the first moment, they decide it's not okay that load shedding is happening, but it is happening. And what am I going to do about this thing that is happening to me? And they're getting active. What we're also seeing is that 30% of individuals in the sample have families. When the lights go out, the social activity goes out. Everybody leaves. Everybody goes to different rooms. People scatter. And when people scatter, the important social bonds that we need to reconnect and get out of those fight and flight responses are also inhibited. What we're seeing with the people who cope, they go to the garden gate, they lean over the wall and talk to a neighbor. They get on the phone to a friend, even if it's just for those three minutes that your battery power is going to last. They get light on the situation. So there are lots of ways and means in which they are coping. But the key way in which they are coping is that they are framing the crisis differently. And they're not saying it's okay. They're saying it's not okay, but how can they cope? They're not going to rely on external sources. They're going to go what we like to think of as psychologically solar. They're lighting themselves up from the inside through activities, meditation, reading, as opposed to scrolling, talking, as opposed to isolating, and thinking through their problems. They're not denying the psychological and emotional impact that load shedding has on every single aspect of their lives. As we can see here, 59% are experiencing extreme financial challenges. So when I think about how people are coping, I think about people suffering on the material level because I'm a good sociologist and I worry about money. I worry about throwing away the food in the fridge. The next time I have to empty my fridge, I actually think I'm going to do violence to the fridge door. It's a terrible feeling that we have when we have to throw away the food that is so hard to come by because our supply chains are being negatively impacted. It's hitting us on every single level. So if you have a look here, that 42% who are depressed, that 60% who are anxious, they are us and we are them. And all of us are experiencing this to greater and lesser degrees. So here's my 59%. These are my financial challenges. I write them on a page. That page is in my head. Then here's my 30%. I'm not talking to my family. I'm isolating from my community. I can't be a good host with a microwave and a KDAC. And my family expects me to produce good quality food and a decent environment when it's cold. I can't do that, so I don't see my family anymore. I maybe see them later, but I'm scared of crime, so I don't go to their house either. Because if I go to their house, what if the criminal breaks in while I'm gone? My alarm's not working. So here's my financial challenges. Here's my social challenge. And now it's hit me psychologically. I've been in that fight or flight response for such a long time that eventually all the chemicals and all the processes are no longer in order. I'm not sleeping. I can't do my daily activities. And so my psychological impact is here. And now in the course of load shedding, here comes the stressor. The power's gone out. The power hasn't come back. 
When is the power coming back? Let me text somebody. Let me check my neighborhood group. This is how I feel. Now, imagine if I tried to take all of these pieces of paper apart. As I tried to take them apart, they will remain crumpled and broken. They will break into one another. So perhaps one of the ways of thinking about this is to understand that all of our stresses are there. But if I get my psychological scaffolding right, when the stressor comes, I do this. I choose how the stressor strikes me as much as I can. Some days I'll be crumpled, some days I'll be straighter. But I think the most important thing that we can do is, when the power goes out, is to think about what are we doing on the financial level? What are we doing on the psychological level? And what are we doing on the relational level? If I can keep one piece of paper only folded once and not crumpled, I get a sense of control back. And so I think I'll yield the rest of my time to my learned colleagues who will talk more about the long-term consequences of load shedding. Thank you.